Growing up, I was big into sports, pretty much everyone, but baseball was by far my favorite sport to play and watch. And so growing up, I knew about sports betting. I knew that it had a negative association with it. I would always hear about one of the best players of all time, the hits king, Pete Rose, being banned from baseball and being banned from the Hall of Fame because he bet on his own games. So I've always had this kind of sour taste in my mouth about the idea of sports betting. But in the recent like two, three, four years, it went from, oh, sports betting is this bad thing to now pretty much everywhere you look, there's sports betting content being promoted everywhere. It's on NBA courts, it's on TV, it's on ads, it's on radios. At the start of every podcast, they're talking about sports betting. After figuring out there was a $400 billion sports gambling industry that was being unregulated, the government wanted their piece. They wanted to make it uh, legal and regulated so that they could tax the heck out of it and make some money from it. So as a result, sports betting is legal in 31 states and the move to make it legal in the rest of the states is happening as we speak. And it's definitely not only because people want sports betting to be legal. Uh, when you look at the battle on the last ballot in California to get sports betting to become legal in the state, people spent between $360 and $570 million to get it onto the bat ballot, and uh, it did not pass, actually. But today I wanted to talk about the dark side of sports betting. When you look at it, it can seem like a positive thing, but I wanted to talk about some of the shady practices that sports betting sites and platforms use to keep you addicted and have you come back after time and time again, and right when you think you're about to be done, they pull you right back in. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem, I'm gonna put resources down below that you can use to go get help, whether you're in the US or the UK, they're down in the top link in the description. So let's talk about the first way that the sports books make money off of you, and that's the idea of spreads. If I went up to you and said, let's flip a coin, if I get it six out of uh, 10 times, I win. If you get it six out of 10 times, you win. That sounds great. If we bet it, it would be a 50-50. So if I put in $100, you'd expect to get $200 back. You wanna double your money because the odds are 50%. When you look at spreads, which are the, the way that are predetermined on basically how much they think a team is gonna win by, it's the idea that it's 50% gonna happen one way, 50% gonna happen the other way. But instead of it being plus 100, which is a sports betting way of showing that you would double your money, it's usually a variation between minus 105 and minus 115. So every bet that you make, you are losing a percentage. So if you go 50% based off of these spreads, you are not gonna break even. The sports book is gonna make money off of you. Parlays are the thing that get the most attention out there. It's the things that go viral about someone that spent $26, bet all these winners for various sports league, and the last one they had was France to win the World Cup. That was $26 to pay out uh, $557,000. So it was the idea that this became very popular and you saw people talking about it all the time. It's the idea of putting in this very unrealistic play, but when it does hit, if it ends up winning, it's gonna pay out a ridiculous amount of money. And it's not just people that are talking about it. The sports books themselves are promoting them because this is the way that they make the most amount of their money. Parlays are the idea that you're stringing together multiple bets and they all have to hit for them to be paid out. So instead of having to get just one bet right for them to pay it out, you have to make all of them uh, win correctly. And when you take into account the fact that they are skimming money off the top, so if it's a spread and you're not getting you know, the plus 100, for every additional bet that you add onto it, they are skimming some of the money off. And this is where they make the most amount of money. That's why you see a lot of promotions about same game parlays, which is the idea of putting a parlay based on the same game that's happening right now, because this is where the sports books make their most amount of money. Now let's talk about bonuses. These are the way that the sports book get you in the door and then keep you hooked. It's the idea, you look at it and it seems like free money. They've had some bets uh, in situations at the beginning of the NFL season, they just started popping them up for the NBA season, where if your team in the NFL uh, was up by seven points at any time and you had a money line bet, meaning that you're betting on the team to win the game overall, your bet would pay out. This seemed like a great way to get people hooked and it seemed like it worked. They stopped it after two weeks because they had to pay out $75 million worth of bets. So you look at that and you're like, that can't be good for them. Well, it's not, but they knew about that. The way that the tax code is set up currently and those losses are able to be offset. Instead of that having to be a, a mistake based off of the sports book, they're able to deduct it from their income. This article that I found talked from 2019 up until 2021 found that betting companies were able to exclude $336 million from their taxes based off of free bets like this. It's tough to get people in the door and get them hooked. And then instead of it being a negative against a the company, they're able to offset a majority of their income uh, from the sports book uh, as a whole. This graphic shows how the sports book did in Colorado, specifically once that went as a, a place where the people could actually bet. And you can see that it is pretty much equaling the amount of revenue that they're bringing in. So they're able to offset all of that income based off of these free bets. 
One of my favorite things about the overlap with my knowledge of the stock market and being interested in topics like this is DraftKings is a publicly traded company, which means that every quarter they have to release their earnings report to all of their shareholders, which in turn gets released to the general public. So we can look into their numbers and see exactly how much money they're making and where they're making it from. The most interesting thing that I wanted to talk about is their monthly unique payers. These are people, uh, the numbers, basically showing how much money they're bringing in per customer that uses it on a monthly basis. Some of the Comparable apps that I wanted to talk about, Meta or Facebook is very good at making money off of people. They make around $41 per user. Snapchat makes around $3 per user. But when you look at DraftKings, a sports book, uh, they are making $100 per customer that uses it on a monthly basis. And that's just an incredible amount of money considering that a year ago in 2021 for the three months that ended in September 30th, they only made $47 million. So they have doubled the amount of money that people, uh, that the sports books are able to make per user. And that's really insane. The places where it starts getting really shady is the algorithms that they use. The sports books, they don't give the free bets to just anyone. If you are winning all of your bets, they're not gonna give you free money because they know that they don't need those extra promotions to keep you hooked. They've come up with algorithms based off of the data that they've gotten from all these tens of thousands of people using the platform to try to find out exactly how many bets it's gonna take of losses in a row before you decide to leave the platform. And then right before you reach that limit, they're gonna give you a little teaser being like, hey, I see that you're kind of frustrated. Here's a free bet where you get your money back if you don't win. And a lot of the times, that's all it takes to get people back involved because they see it, oh, well, I would be passing up free money if I don't take this offer. So it's the idea that they're able to figure out exactly when you're about to break, and then they give you that little freebie to keep you coming. But that free bet is not really a free bet. If that bet loses, you get your money back up to a certain amount, whether it be $10 limit or a $25 limit, but it's a non-refundable bet, meaning that if that was all the money that you had, you don't get that money back, you get a voucher for another bet with that same valuation. So it's not like if you lose the bet, the money gets put right back into your account, you're just given a token that's worth that amount of money. So it makes it so that once you use it, it expires a week after you get it, so then you have to use it again. So these are some of the shady practices that I've seen from sports books to make sure that they keep you hooked, and once you get on there, it's really tough to leave. So finally, I wanted to talk about gambling addiction because that is not the fun thing to talk about when it comes to sports betting and the idea of hopefully trying to make money and making sports more entertaining. But I think it's a really important topic when we're talking about the shady practices that go along with sports betting and the gambling industry as a whole. From a study that I found in 2013, found that neither betting experience or knowledge gave you any advantage. What this means is that people will have a false sense of security of, you know, I grew up playing these sports. I've watched them for my entire life. I must be really good at it. So instead of thinking, oh, you know what, I suck at this, I'm not gonna put that much money on it, you think, oh, I know how the sports work, I'm gonna put more money because I feel like I have an edge. The edge is the percentage that you're going to win on average if you play for a certain amount of time once you get to the averages. You can look at the historical averages for uh, casino games. When you look at it, one of the best ones is gonna be blackjack, which has a 1% casino edge, which means that on average, you're gonna win around 49% of the time, meaning that over the long run, you are gonna lose money no matter what. But this study finds that there is no statistical advantage to uh, having knowledge about the sport or being an experienced better. You're all on even playing field and you have a false sense of security and confidence that, oh, I'm smarter than the sports books, I can make money from this, when from the studies, we know that that's not true. With that house edge that we talked about from spreads, uh, the house edge is sitting around 5%, which is pretty high. So over the long run, you're likely gonna lose money but it's become so accessible where you can do it from your phone without really having to think about it. You can bet on individual at bats in a baseball game, the next bucket in a basketball game, and it's all about that next dopamine hit, and that's where the addiction starts coming in. Some of the numbers that I found is that after being legalized in 30 states and some other countries, it is the most accessible it's ever been to gamble. This study that I found found that 60 to 80% of high school students reporting having gambled money in the past year, and four to 6% of them are considered addicted to gambling already. So as it becomes more accessible and more mainstream, it is more common for people to get hooked onto it because of those continuous dopamine hits that you can have. And the long-term damaging effects on it are so awful. It can be monetary, it can be social, it can be relationships, all of it. Sports gambling is an addiction if you get to the point where you, that's all you're thinking about. And that's kind of the argument that I'm making in this video is that the shady practices used by the sports book to keep you hooked are doing more damage than they have in the past where you had to physically go to a casino uh, or you know, search for it on the dark web or wherever you have to find it. I know saying the dark web makes me sound like a boomer, but you had to really search for it. And now that it's so accessible, it's so much easier to get hooked onto sports betting as compared to how it was five, 10 years ago. So 
that's what I wanted to talk about today, the shady ways that these sports books keep you hooked, whether it be the free bets, whether it be the spreads, whether it be the parlays that they're promoting. They are experts at keeping you involved, and that's how we've seen in the past year. They've went from making $47 per customer to $100, and I expect that to continue over time. So my name is Andy. I hope you learned something from this video. Let me know your experience with sports gambling down below, and let me know if there are other topics you'd like me to discuss in future videos. If you made this far, please hit that subscribe button, and more videos from me will pop up on the screen right now. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.